Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, and as you bow your heads, I, I also want to remind you of the incident that happened in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh this past week, Pennsylvania. If you didn't follow the news, a synagogue, someone walked into a Jewish synagogue yesterday, killed 11 people, wounded four. And uh, right now, I can only imagine what that community must be going through, and we need to pray for them. So right now, as we bow our heads, would you help me pray for what's happening in Pittsburgh, for God's peace and comfort and wisdom. You know, our country is going through uh, some difficult times right now. We need, we need prayer. And uh, we need to pray. And you need to go out and vote on Tuesday. And you'll be hearing more about that later on. But let's bow our heads. Let us pray. Father God, uh, we thank you today for the privilege of gathering in this place of worship. And Father, we gather here to spend some time with you, Lord. Father, you said that you would uh, inhabit the praises of your people. You said, Lord, that when we gathered, your presence would be among us. And we thank you in advance for your presence that we have already felt, Lord, as we have been here. But Father, our hearts today turn, Lord, not only to those in our house today that have needs, but it turns to Pittsburgh, Lord, in the situation there among the Jewish community in the synagogue there, the Tree of Life Synagogue. Father, we pray for the families of those that lost loved ones. We pray your peace and your comfort. We pray, Lord, for that individual that perpetrated this crime, Lord. And uh, Lord, as, uh, as much as we want to uh, leash out at him and Father's we know that you love him and uh, you have a plan and a purpose for his life. Touch him. And Father, we just pray your hand be upon that community, the leaders there, the first responders. Lord, those that are uh, ministering. I'm sure there's a lot of churches right there in that area that are sharing your love, Lord. And we just pray for them and for all of those that are suffering, Lord, not only there, but Lord, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, Lord, in our families. We, bring, we present to you, Lord, what's going to go on from this point forward. I ask your blessing and I do so in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen, amen. You know, today is the last uh, message in our series on marriage called Unlocking Marriage. And what I want to do today is I want to talk to you on the subject of deadly affairs. And here's what I want to do this morning. There's four things I want to do. I want to talk to you about what causes affairs. I want us to look at what, why do people have affairs. Number two, how does that happen? What's the process of affairs? And number three, how do you recover? If your marriage has been rocked by an affair, how do you recover from that? And then lastly, I want to talk about some preventative steps you can take to make sure that your marriage is not rocked by an affair. Amen? Can I hear a good amen to that? So that's my goal today. Let me start off by reading to you Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. And notice what God says about marriage. God says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. You know, right off the top, I want you to understand that God says that the remedy to immorality in your marriage is to have a proper appreciation for it. You know, the, the Bible says that, you know, we honor God. God, God has, has made marriage an honorable thing. God established it, and God set the parameters. God says marriage is honorable, and what that means is that it's precious. You know what? It's, it, it, it has a great price. We must care for it. We must take care of it. You know, America, for the most part, has abandoned the idea of a moral God. And as a result of that, we live in a culture today where a lot of Americans, you know what, no longer care what God has to say on any subject. On the subject of family, of marriage, of adultery, America doesn't care. You know, today, there is a lot of immorality that's going on. But, but Americans don't attach morality to it. In other words, it's neither right or wrong. If you want to go out and be immoral and cheat on your spouse, you know what? That's up to you. It's a, it's a relative thing to the people that are involved. And yet God says, I intended couples to be faithful to each other. God says, I established marriage as an honorable institution. And when God says that he expects us to be faithful, the word faithful has the idea of not soiling it. In other words, something that's free from deformity. In other words, God says adultery soils. Adultery deforms marriage and makes it into something God never intended it to be. It creates a lot of heartache and a lot of hurt, a lot of disappointment, disillusionment. It affects not only the adults involved in it, but it affects the children. It affects the family, parents. It affects everybody involved in it. And you know, God says, God takes this so serious that the Hebrew, writer to the Hebrew tells us that God will judge the immoral. And God will judge the adulterer. Notice that he uses two words. The word immoral is the Greek word parnos. And it actually is a word that refers in Roman times to a man or a woman who prostituted their body. Or a person who indulged in unlawful sexual intercourse. You know what? Either with someone else's spouse 
or someone who isn't their spouse. And uh, the Bible says that God, God takes that very serious. Now, the question that I want us to ask today is that why do people have affairs? I mean, why does that happen? Over there in Proverbs, in chapter 22, in verse 14, notice what the Bible says. God says, a mouth of an immoral woman, and I included in parentheses a man, it's a dangerous trap. The Bible says that adultery is a trap. It's a trap that is so easy to fall into. Jesus said these words in Matthew 26. Jesus said, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You know what? No matter who you are or how long you've been married or how long you've been a Christian, the Bible says, and God says, you need to be careful. You need to be aware. You need to be cognizant of the fact that at any point you can be tempted and you can fall and you can create a big problem for your marriage, especially in the area of adulteries. But, but I will, I've often asked myself, and I'm sure you've asked yourself, why would anyone want to risk their marriage by having an affair? Now, let me say up front, a lot of research has been done on this. And let me also say up front that this is a difficult message. By the way, I, I'm going to share with you a message that most pastors would not dare share with their congregation. And, uh, but I, I, I care about your marriages. Uh, this is a serious problem. It's a real problem. And I want you to know not only what God says, but how you can overcome it and what you can do if you have become a victim or you're in the middle of it right now. But a lot of research has been done on this issue of affairs. As a matter of fact, even though it's very secretive, and a lot of people don't like to talk about this, so when they give statistics, they're a little bit afraid because we're not, we're not sure exactly because sometimes uh, men and women are not honest on this subject, but this is what they tell us. Stats tell us that over half of all non-Christian men will have an affair during the lifetime of their marriage, over half. Some statisticians have even suggested that as high as 70% of all married men at one time or another will have an affair. And then 50% of all married women, uh, uh, non-Christian married women, will have an affair sometime in their lifetime. And here's what's startling. These statistics are statistics of, of the world, non-Christians, but they are just as high among Christians, among followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that tells me? That tells me that there are a lot of unprincipled people out there who don't see adultery as a problem. And because of that, you have to be careful. You know, it is so bad that there are actually websites where you can go and hook up with people of like mind who want to have an affair and don't care what anybody thinks. And there's not one, there's not two, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, uh, websites. Listen to what one guy said about why he had an affair. This is what he said. He said, you know, after I got married, she changed. She just got so wrapped up in our kids. I felt forgotten emotionally and sexually. Not to mention, we spend no time together. I'm a terrible communicator. I've always had problems talking with her about my life and what's really going on with me. The, woman, the women I see now, they get me. I can talk to them. I can really share with them. You know what? They don't judge me. They don't scold me. They don't tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. I can just be me, and they're okay with that. Wow, that's what one guy said. Now, the research has shown that there are three common denominators in people who have affairs. There are three things that they have noticed that are, that are very important. In other words, here's number one. When affairs begin, a person typically doesn't fall in love with the other person, at least not initially. This is what they tell us. People who have affairs fall in love with the fantasy. In other words, the image that they create in their mind about the other person. You know what? People get into affairs believing this person is the one. This person will complete me. This person will understand me. This person will solve all my problems. And you know what psychologists and psychiatrists say? They say this is simply a made-up image. It is a fantasy. Someone that we create in our mind, but they're not really real. They're not real people. It's, it's all in here. And that's very important. The second thing that they have found is that affairs at the core are about a deep need for affirmation and validation. In other words, people who go out and have affairs, they have a deep need for affirmation and validation. And of course, that's understandable. You know, who doesn't like someone telling them they look or smell good? Who doesn't like somebody being attracted to them and telling them I'm attracted to you? Who doesn't, who doesn't like being valued and appreciated by somebody? But you know what's interesting? They're not falling in love with that other person. They're falling in love with this new, wonderful image of me 
This me that's receiving praise and affirmation and validation and now is being acknowledged and, and told I'm great. You know, they're, they're in love with themselves. It feels good when that happens. And then the third thing that they have discovered is that people in affairs become intoxicated by the feeling they get with every new encounter. In other words, you get hooked on it. Not on the person, not on the individuals that they're having affairs with, but on the feelings. And we know that because here's what psychiatrists tell us. Psychiatrists tell us that initially when you're out having an affair, there are some chemicals that fire in your brain, powerful chemicals. You know, a chemical like dopamine, which is the same feeling that cocaine and nicotine give you. It's a high. And then there's adrenaline and, you know, serotonin. These are all high uh, chemicals that fire off in your brain that make you feel good, that give you a high, that addict you. And that's what's happening. And they tell us that people who go out and have affairs, it's the firing of those chemicals and they're hooked, they're intoxicated. They love the feeling. That's what it's about. So here's what I'm telling you. Here's what Richard says. Basically, affairs often have very little to do with the other person. Instead, what affairs do is that they reveal a deep inner longing for affirmation and validation of who I am. You know, affairs have a way of tricking people into thinking what I told you earlier. You know what? This new person this, that I'm finding that makes me feel good, that's the one. That's my soulmate. But what they're really in love with is really in love with themselves. It's what's going on within themselves that they're captivated by. You know, I tell you that to tell you this. Before you go out and make such a drastic mistake like having an affair because you want to feel validated and affirmed, and that's normal and that's good and there's nothing wrong with that. But before you go out and, do a, and have a destructive, deadly affair, why don't you step back a little bit and maybe think, are there other ways that I can feel affirmed and validated? Is there another way where I could have my needs met without going and destroying my life and my marriage and my children and everybody else? Are there healthier ways? And I want to suggest to you there are. There are healthier, less destructive ways. You don't have to go out and have an affair to feel good about yourself. Can I hear a, a good amen to that? So let's look a little closer. I gave you the, the, the big picture of what they tell us why we have affairs. But here's the reality. What causes people to go out and have affairs? Number one is unmet needs. You know, when, when any of our basic needs is not being met, it, the door to temptation opens up. By the way, we all have needs. And when those needs are not met, it's easy to go and look somewhere else to have those needs met. Now, here's what we know. For men, you know what men's greatest need is? It's a sexual need. And when that isn't met at home, it's natural and normal and not out of the ordinary for them to look and think maybe there's some of that somewhere else. For women, the greatest need is an emotional need. It's a need to connect with their spouse. You know, most affairs that women have, they start with an emotional connection, attachment. They're not sexually attracted to that individual. What they are attracted to is how they talk to me and how they understand me. You know what, how they listen and, 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 you know, and not only for women, but that's also true for many men. Our needs are very important. One of the probably the most extreme of unmet needs is being mistreated. You know, when, when we're mistreated in our, in our marriage. You know, I'm not talking about violence, even though physical violence is probably the extreme of, 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 of being mistreated, but sometimes just being ignored, sometimes just being neglected. You know, when, when you're mistreated that way, you feel trapped. You know, and, and that's not healthy. It's not healthy for anybody to feel that they're mistreated. And if people don't get the love and the respect that they crave at home and, and the needs that they have at home, they're going to they're gonna naturally, it's normal, they're going to search for it elsewhere. Whether they're looking for it or not, it's going to come to them because it's going to be appealing when somebody talks to me or, or, or shows me that I matter. You know, unmet needs, they're very real. The second thing we know about affairs is that they're caused by unfulfilled expectations. Now, what does that mean? That means this. There are people that are out there having affairs and really they have a wonderful life. You know what? They have a wonderful marriage. They have wonderful kids. They live in a nice neighborhood. That have, they have everything they want. But deep down inside, it hasn't turned out the way they thought it would turn out. In other words, their expectations are not fulfilled. You know, and, and what happens is they begin to feel bitter. They begin to feel cheated. You know, especially when they look at other couples and, you know what, look at other ladies. And the guy looks at other guys and, you know what, they're happy. And they got it together. And why can't I be happy? You know, I, I, I got everything, but, but I'm not happy. Why? Because my expectations haven't been fulfilled. And when you feel that way, what happens is that you begin to think, I have a right to be happy. So they start excusing. We start excusing our behavior. You know, when we feel cheated, it's amazing how Satan will make sure somebody comes into our path 
that also feels cheated and connects us to them so that we can, you know what, connect. Satan's a master at that, and you need to be aware of it. But unfulfilled expectations in our marriage. And then the third reason is emotional immaturity. What does that mean? It means that there are some people that are married that are emotionally very immature. They may be married to a 10. You know what? But they, it's, it's not about who they're married to. It's about them. Let me give you an example. A guy who was a star, football star, or an athlete in, in high school or college, you know what? And he got all his strokes and he was all of validation and praise. Hey, you're a great guy. And now he gets married and no one's stroking him. And because he feels immature and because his self-esteem is down, he's going to go start looking somewhere else. Or, or the girl who was the cheerleader and the most popular one at her school and everybody thought, told her, you're beautiful, you're wonderful. Now she's a wife and she's at home and nobody talks to her, nobody notices her. She feels stuck, she feels nobody cares. And her esteem starts going down. That's why I tell you guys and I tell you gals, you have to build up your spouse. You can never say enough to build them up, uh, how, how beautiful, how handsome, how wonderful they are. You know, if we get strokes from each other, we're not going to be looking to other people to get our strokes or get our validation. You know what, when in our marriage we're talking to each other, you know what, and appreciating each other, you know, it, doesn't, it, it eliminates the need to go out and look elsewhere. You know, sometimes there are people out there that are so immature that sometimes they'll just go out and have affairs because, uh, you know what, it, it, it's forbidden. You know what, and, and, and they, they think if I become a little adventurous, you know what, and I have a fair, it's going to prove to me that I still have it. You know, that's why the midnight crisis, a guy hits his 45, 50, 55 years old, all of a sudden he starts opening up the collar and he gets his big medallion, you know, and, and you know, the sports car and wants the hood down. And, and, and you, know, you know why we do that? Because we want to feel young. We want to feel that we still have it. The reason we have to feel we still have it is because there's something inside of us that says, you're not good enough. You don't have it. So you have to prove something. It's called immaturity, emotionally immaturity. And it's happening quite a bit. The fourth reason people have uh, affairs is unresolved conflict. You know, in marriage, we're going to have conflict. Listen, if you're married, you're going to have conflict. And when you have conflict, you respond to conflict in one of two ways. One way that you, resolve, you, you respond to conflict is you work it out. You know, you, you, have, you have the tools. You have the ability to work out conflict. And you know what happens when you work out conflict? It draws you together. It creates, it creates uh, intimacy, emotional intimacy. It brings you closer together more than ever before. And when you do it the right way, it has, conflict has a, a, good, a good process in our life. But there are other people, when they have conflict, they, they don't do that. They withdraw. They avoid each other. And when you do that, Satan is there. And Satan will put somebody in your life that's going to understand you. Someone that knows what you're going through. And you're going to say, you know, I, I found somebody who understands me. I found somebody at work. I found somebody at church. I found somebody in the family that understands me. And you know what God says? Watch out. By the way, you shouldn't be talking to people of the opposite sex about the problems that you're having at home, whether it's at church, whether it's at work, whether it's among your family. You shouldn't be talking about to people of the opposite sex because what happens, unless it's a professional counselor, because what happens is that you connect with them emotionally. And when you experience emotional intimacy, it's real easy to understand that that's something more than that. So be very careful. And I'll, I'll talk to you that, about that a little bit more later on. But you know what happens a lot? We have problems. We have conflict. So we go to work and we start sharing with this person. And all of a sudden you say, you know what? This person understands me. You know, this person is, is easy to talk to. You know why? You know why that person is easy to talk to? Because you don't have communication problems with that person. You know why you don't have communication problems with that person? Because you're in a perfect environment. Amen. You're at your best. You smell your best. You look your best. You don't have to live with them 24-7. And you begin to think, this person really understands me. But I promise you, if you were to marry them in a year or two, you would be saying, I don't understand them. They don't understand me. I can't talk to them. We have nothing in common. And that is so true. Can I say, can I hear a good amen to that? Be careful with conflict in your marriage. Number five, uncontrolled thoughts. You know, be careful with your thought life. We live in a culture today where we are bombarded. We're fed a constant diet of immorality. Have you noticed that? Billboards, movies, TV, magazines, books, records, you, you name it. It's all around. 
You know, they don't sell, they, don't, they can't sell soap today without showing a half-naked woman or a good-looking guy. You know, and, and people say, well, i got to buy that soap because if I buy that soap, you know what, maybe a, a good-looking lady like that or a good-looking guy like that will take notice in me. But you got to be careful with that. You know, the Bible says that out of the heart of man comes evil things. And what you think is what's going to come out of your life. The Bible says, watch your thought life. Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, if a man commits lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery. Jesus said, be careful what's going on in your mind, what you're feeding on, because that's going to affect what you feel, what you think, how you act. It's going to affect your character. It's going to affect your actions. It's going to affect your life. It's going to affect your destiny. Be very careful with that. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, but pastor, you know, we, we live in a world where, you know what, there's so many attractive things. And are you saying we, we, we can't pay attention? No, no, no. Listen, lust, lust. Lust is not appreciation. Lust, appreciation, and admit, admiration is not the same thing. You know, you can admire and you can appreciate and you can get excited about something. You know what? Doesn't mean you're committing lust. You know, if I if I go to the restaurant and I'm, I'm hungry and I pass by this couple that's sitting down and they they bought this wonderful steak. I look at that steak. I begin to look, I begin to look at that steak. I said, man, that looks good. You know what? I, I I want something like that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You see a beautiful car, you stop and say, man, that's a beautiful car. You see a beautiful woman, you're, you're at the, you know, you're, you're, and you say, that's a beautiful woman. There's nothing wrong with that. Be, uh, admiring beauty is not the problem. That's not lust. But listen, because God, God made men to be attracted to women, and God made women to be attracted to men. So I'm not suggesting that, that you know, attraction is a sin. Attraction is not a sin, but attraction is not lust. Lust is when you begin to linger on that person and mentally you commit adultery with that person you know what lust is not saying you know that's a good looking woman or that's a good looking guy it's you taking that a little further and thinking i wonder what that person would be like without clothes in bed i wonder if there's a possibility where i can set up an encounter it's not the attraction that's the problem you know what it's, it's where you go with that it's what you do with that when i was a brand new christian the way they explained it to me uh, back in the 70s they would say vic I was a 16, 17-year-old boy that would say, Vic, stare and admire, but don't desire, because the moment you desire, you're lusting. And they were right. Because lust is when you begin to focus, you know what, for the purpose of planning in your mind, what would that be like? And you begin to do things in your mind, fantasies begin to happen. Be careful with that. That is lust. The sixth thing is an unprotected lifestyle. Unprotected lifestyle. You know, one, one area of unprotected lifestyle is when you got improper relationships with the opposite sex. You know, people ask me, Pastor, can we have a, a meaningful relationship with someone of the opposite sex? Yes, you can. But you got to be careful. There is a fine line that if you have a relationship, ladies, with a guy or guys that's not your husband, you know what? There's a fine line that you have to be, be careful not to cross. When that friendship, you begin to have feelings for that person that's a you know, platonic friend, we're just mutual friends, we're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. You got to be careful and you got to be honest with yourself. But sometimes we don't protect ourselves in that area. Be careful. Another area of where we don't protect our lifestyle is when we're fatigued and when we're tired. Do you know that when we're tired, our defenses are down? We are a lot more vulnerable you know what, to temptation when we're tired. We're a lot more vulnerable, you know what, to things happening in our life when, when we're disappointed, when we have experienced failure, when we have experienced letdown. It's real easy when we're just worn out to let our defenses down and make some really foolish decisions. Another area where we got to protect our lifestyle is not only in relationships with the opposite sex, not only when you're tired and you're worn down, but also during times of success. You know, major successes in our lives makes us think we're King Kong. We're on top of the world. I can do everything. There's nothing I can't do. And I can do even bad stuff and get away with it. No, you can't. You know, sometimes our successes makes us feel more about ourselves. It's pride. Makes us feel more about ourselves than what actually is. And we'll go out and make some really dumb decisions. Be careful. First of Corinthians 10, 12 says, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. In other words, the Bible says that if you think you're strong, and by the way, that word strong means, you know what, I'm established, I'm safe, I'm beyond harm. You know what, I don't waver. Be careful if you think you're all of that and you're beyond this. You are not beyond this. If you're not careful, God says you're going to fall. And the word fall means you're going to collapse. You're going to be brought down. You need to protect your lifestyle. You need to be on the guard, especially in this area, you know what, of sexual temptation and affairs. 
The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And what that means is that at any point in time, any of us could be tempted. Any of us, you too, me too, can go out and do things that we will regret later on. Listen, let me tell you something. Everybody has a price. You know what? Everybody at some point in their life, if they're not careful, their weakness and opportunity will collide. And when that happens, if you're not aware of this, you're going to give in and you're going to find yourself making some really bad decisions. That's why if you don't want to get stung by the bees, stay away from the bees. Can I hear a good amen to that? And I'll tell you again, there's a lot of unprincipled people out there who will take advantage of you, who don't care about what God says, about adultery and the damage. They've done it so much, they're immune to it, and they don't care. Be aware of that. And they're smooth talkers and they're great listeners, amen? And some of them are very good looking, men and women. Yes? Number seven, unreliable commitment. Unreliable commitment. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Bible says that marriage is built on a commitment. And the fact that your commitment is going to be tested, you need to know that in your lifetime, many, many times, your commitment to your spouse, expect it. Satan is going to make sure you know what, that, that opportunities are presented to you. He's already you know what, put together a plan to trip you up. And it doesn't matter how much you love God. It doesn't matter how much you love your spouse. It doesn't matter how much you love your family. You know what? If you're not careful, you're going to fall into his trap. Adultery is a trap. So, so you have to be committed to your marriage. But listen, here's what I have found. It's not just to be committed to your marriage. You've got to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That when you're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, the other commitments are a little bit easier. Can I hear an amen to that? You know, I... Uh, when I, married my, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ on March 31st, 1973, when I married my wife in 1975, I made a commitment. And I used to think that it was a one-time commitment. I only did it once. But you know what I'm learning? It's a daily commitment. You know what? My commitment to Jesus Christ is a daily. It's a recommitment to my wife. It's a recommitment. I have to do it on a regular basis. Because I have come to understand that if my commitment to Jesus is low, it's going to start affecting all my other commitments, and it's going to be easy for me to rationalize all kinds of behaviors and all kinds of stuff that is not right. Often I'll say, in my prayers, I'll say, Lord, I never want this to happen in my life. After a counseling session where I have dealt with this, you know what, one of the greatest impacts is to me. And I'll, after the, the couple leaves, I'll, I'll say, Lord, may this never happen to me. It would devastate my wife. It would devastate my kids. It would devastate the congregation. Lord, it would devastate you that saved me and loved me. And I never, ever, 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 ever want to do that. But I need your help, Lord. I need your help every day. Because the people I just talked to are great people. They're good people. They're amazing people. And Lord, they fell. Your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and to your marriage and then just let me maybe give you one more, because there's a lot of other reasons. You know, there are people that go out and have affairs, and they, they, they want to get caught. They do it intentionally, hoping to get caught. You know why? They don't have the courage to tell their spouse, I want out. And they're hoping that they get kicked out, and they, you know, just get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. They'd rather deal with it that way than to deal with it head on. Now, not to mention, you know what? Today, they talk to us a lot about sexual addiction. There are people that have sexual addictions. There are people out there that are just, you know what, they're just nasty people and that's how they live and, and that's how they do life. But there's a lot of reasons and you need to be aware of that and you need to be on guard. Now, how does it happen? Pastor, how, how, does, how, how does immorality, what is the process of immorality? You know what, how, how do these affairs happen? Well, listen to what James says in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. He says this, he says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Listen, here's what James is saying. People don't just instantly fall into immorality, especially committed Christians. In other words, there was a, a series of events that prepared them, that made them vulnerable to that experience. You know what? People don't live moral lives and then one day just wake up and, and decide, I'm going to go out and be immoral and commit adultery. No, no, it's a process. And I'll tell you what that process looks like. It's a very simple process. It all starts in your mind. It starts with harboring sinful thoughts in your mind. The battle is always in the mind. You know, and if you lose your battle in the mind, if you lose a battle in the mind, you're going to lose a battle and you're going to lose the war. That's why you got to protect your mind. That's why pornography is so dangerous and so subtle. 
It barrages the mind with sinful, crazy thoughts, leaving images in your brain that you cannot get rid of for a long time. It takes an immense moving of the Holy Spirit to purge our minds of all of that filth that we have put in our minds. But you know what that filth does? That filth motivates you and, and, and causes you to go and do things that you would not otherwise do. Now, Pastor, but, but some of you are saying, well, Pastor, yeah, you know what? We all have sexual thoughts. We all have sexual fantasies. You know what? All of us, we all deal with that. And to that I say, you're absolutely right. But what you do with those fantasies, you know what? That are normal is important. But if you're feeding it with junk, they're going to get out of order. They're going to be out of control. There are people today that, that sexual fantasies are out of order. And when you talk to them, it's all about pornography. And they do some crazy stuff, even killing people. So what do you do with these sexual fantasies that are normal? I'm not talking about the abnormal one. Well, I'll tell you what you do. Number one, you talk to it. You talk to your spouse about it. You be honest. By the way, that's one of the most difficult conversations to have. But you have to talk. You've got to get it out. If you don't express it to your spouse, you're going to express it in another way. Express it to your wife, to your husband. Deal with it. Work on it. And then put a filter on your mind. Because you know the thought life is where Satan starts. That's where he gets you. And if you don't stop at this stage of the thoughts, you're going to take it to the next stage, which is not physical, but an emotional involvement. You know, adultery begins in the head long before it gets into the bed. Let me hear an amen to that. You know, typically a guy or a woman start fishing. They're hurting. Their needs are not being met. You know what? In their mind, they made up their mind, I'm going to start looking. So they start fishing for compliments or they start flattering you. Now, let me be very honest with you. Let me be very transparent on this. With unbelievers, once the messages go out and the mess signals go out, the signals are turned on to the unbeliever from, from the mind, you know what, to emotional uh, it, it doesn't last very long there. Before you know it, they're in bed together because they don't care. They don't have a moral compass. You know what? To them, it's normal. Animals do it. We're animals, so it's okay for us to do it. But for the believer, and by the way, the believer, for the believer, we struggle with the same thing. But you know what? Among Christians, there's a lot of game playing among Christians. You know, and what Christians do is that we start flirting or, you know what, start fishing for compliments but the way we justify it is we tell ourselves, well, nothing's happening. You know what? God understands. I'm just a red-blooded American human being. But you know the Bible says flirting is a sin. You know why flirting is a sin? Let me, let me tell you why. You are arousing a desire in someone that you cannot righteously fulfill. You are sending signals and messages to that person that either you have no intention or you can't or you're willing, depending, but regardless, that signal and that message you're sending is not a godly message. When you're flirting and when you're teasing and when you're doing that type of stuff, as a follower of Christ, God says, my children shouldn't be doing that. Non-Christians, the world does that, but not my kids. Well, pastor, are you saying we can't pay compliments to each other? Are, are you saying we can't play around? No, no, we, we need to pay compliments. And we can jest, but be careful with how you do that. It can get out of control. And you know when it gets out of control, what you're finding in churches, Christians, you know what, they hook up with people at church. That's a shame. That's sad. But it happens. And it happens because of attraction. It happens because we flirt. It happens because we're, we're, we're looking for compliments. God says, be careful with that. It starts in the mind, and then once we decide we're going to do it, we start looking, you know, forming attachments. And once those attachments, emotional attachments are made, we go to physical attachment, to involvement. And that's where the line's crossed. You know how it starts? You start touching, kissing, putting your hand around them, rubbing. You know what? Before you know it, you're hugging, your little kiss. Before you know it, you're rendezvousing, and you're having sex. And listen, once you cross this line... It takes a lot of God. It takes a lot of Holy Spirit to get you to overcome it. Can I hear a good amen to that? Once you cross that line, you're in the grips of these chemicals in your brain that Satan is going to use, you know, to destroy you. Because Satan isn't going to stop till he destroys you. You know what? He's going to rob you. He's going to kill you. He's going to destroy you. And he's not going to stop until he obliterates you and everything about you from the face of the earth. Now, some of you say, Pastor, you're painting a, a, bleak, a bleak picture of, of adultery. It's not that bad. Yeah, yeah, it is in some cases. I've seen lives destroyed. I've seen marriages destroyed. I've seen families that haven't overcome it because it's been so hurtful and so painful. It is deadly. Deadly affairs are exactly that. They kill. They destroy. 
Be careful of that. And then the last stage is, you know what, after we do it, we think it, we, 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 we play with it, we, we, we do it, and then we rationalize it. I'm only human, Pastor. You know, we're human, but we're Christians. We have God's spirit in us. We can say no. Can you imagine a thief that goes into your house and he robs and he kills somebody in your family at the court of the trial? He says, well, well, judge, I'm only human. I mean, you would, if you had a gun, you'd probably shoot them and get rid of them right there, right? You know, we have all kinds of excuses. I'm only human. You know what, Pastor, if my husband or my wife only met my needs, I wouldn't have to do this. You know what, God will forgive me. You know, when I hear that argument, when I hear people say God's going to forgive me, I think the audacity of that person to presume upon the grace of God. What kind of fool do you think our God is where you can say that and think you can get away with it? Because I will tell you, God will forgive, but you know who he forgives? Those that repent and turn around and don't do it anymore. Not those habitual violators of adultery and say it's okay because God will forgive. You are wrong. You know, and in the church of Jesus Christ, and we have to be careful because I believe in the grace of God. And I teach that there's nothing that you can do that God can forgive. But when you start playing games with God, you better be careful. And there are a lot of people that that's exactly what they're doing. They're playing games. And you think you're getting away with it, but with God, we don't get away with anything. We will be judged for it. We will deal with it. That's how it happens. From the thought to an emotional attachment to a physical attachment. And then we begin to rationalize all the stuff we're doing. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter how much you rationalize it. You're wrong. You're in sin. You're going to give an account to God. Get it right. So, Pastor, what do we do? Pastor, if I, uh, you know, how do we recover? You know, okay, so, you know what? God is speaking to my heart. I've crossed the line. I want to make it right. How can I fix this? What do I have to do? Well, let me tell you what you have to do. Number one, you've got to acknowledge your sin. You've got to fess up. You know, I love Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is written by David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And David says he was miserable. For one year, he thought he got away with it. He thought nobody knew, but God knew from the beginning. And one year later, Nathan the prophet comes and he says, you, you're an adulterer, you are a killer. You are Because he not only committed adultery, he killed her husband, Uriah. But look at what David's prayer is in Psalm 51. Powerful, powerful prayer. He says this, he writes this. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You know, I love David because David doesn't blame his wife. He doesn't try to excuse it. He doesn't say, Lord, you know, those 300 wives, I don't know how many. He had all kinds of wives. You know what? They're no good. He didn't say that. He says, Lord, I have sinned against you. My rebellion has been against. He admits it. No excuses, no blaming. Just very simple. Acknowledge, confess, tell the Lord, forgive me. That's where it starts. You want to get it right? Go to God for forgiveness. Here's the second thing. If you are in the middle of a relationship or have been caught up in one that's illicit, you know what? In that relationship, immediately, stop, today. Hebrews 3.15 says, now is the time. Today, if you hear God's voice speaking to you, do not harden your heart against him. You know what? Right away. No discussing, no slowly. You know what I have found? People, when they have affairs, they slowly get away from God. No, no, if you want to get it right, you don't slowly confess or acknowledge. You do it right away and you move fast back and you restore the relationship with God right away, as fast as possible. You know, it's not, well, I got to work my way in. No, you get in the the presence of God and you get alone with God and you take care of it because he'll take you, he'll forgive you, and he'll get you on the right track. The third thing is whatever, do whatever it takes to avoid contact with that person. Stay away from that person. No contact. No explanations. No lunches. No letting them down slowly. If you have to change churches, change churches. If you have to move out of the area. If you're serious, move out of the area. Pastor, but I work with that person. Well, maybe you need to change your job also. But no, I got a good job. I know, but it's going to destroy you. You know, the Bible says, what does it matter if you gain the whole world? You gain a promotion. You have a great job, but you lose your soul. You lose your marriage. You lose your family. You lose your children. So that's what you have to do. You know what? Acknowledge it. Break it off. You know what? Stay away from that person. Stay close to God. Get into some counseling. Talk to somebody and get it right. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. All right. I feel better because you guys are getting pretty quiet and serious on me. Now, I want to end with this. What are some things that we can do to avoid 
you know what, this, because it happens a lot. Pastor, what, what advice? What does the Bible say? Well, first of all, let me say you, there's three things that you need to do if you're going to overcome this or never fall into this trap. The first thing you have to do is you got to affair proof yourself. You got to take care of yourself. You got to make sure that you are committed to not doing it. It starts with you. Second thing you have to do is you have to affair proof your spouse. Make sure your spouse doesn't have a reason whatsoever why he or she would be looking anywhere else. And then the third thing is, you got to watch your lifestyle. You know what? Watch your life. Watch where you hang out. Watch what you do. Watch all of those things. you got to take responsibility for yourself. So let me talk to you about a couple of steps. And there's a lot of them, but I'm going to go fast. Number one, make a commitment to God's standard of morality. Say, that will not be something that we will do. That is not an option for me. And I recognize that even though it's not an option, if I'm not careful, I can slip into it. But it's not an option. I'm going to take a strong, strong moral stand on this. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Commit yourself to the word of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell your spouse, honey, I am committed to you for all the days of our life. That's number one. Number two, maintain your marriage. Take care of your marriage. Over there in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it says, do not cheat each other. Abnormal sexual intercourse or you will expose yourself to the obvious temptations of Satan. You know what that verse says? That verse says, that sexu your sexual relationship in a marriage is a spiritual responsibility that you have to your mate. You know, when you got married, you made an exclusive contract that there was one area in our life that, that, that we would not share with anyone but only our partner. You know, and, and that is the area of sex. And I want to I ask you, if your partner can't have his needs or her needs net, met by you, where are they going to go? Who's going to meet those needs? Now, I know that's something women don't like to hear and guys don't like to hear. But I'll tell you, there's a big problem today when in marriage we use sex as a form of punishment and we hold it, withhold it from our spouse, thinking we're going to manipulate and get our way. All you're doing is pushing them away. That's what you're doing. Now you say, well, Pastor, you're putting a big trip on No, I'm not putting a big trip on you. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's an excuse. But what I'm saying is that's a reality. It's a reality. You know, if you don't provide a magnet at home for your mate, Satan's going to provide a, a magnet somewhere else. And, you know, I used to think this was just, just a, you know what, a, a male issue. In other words, the males complain. But you know what? Women are complaining now. Do you know that there's a lot of guys out there that they come, they've been married, and they have no sexual appetite for their spouse. And the first thing the, spa, the wife thinks is, well, he must have somebody else. No, he doesn't have anybody else. You know what's happening? He's stressed out. Work has stressed them out. They have no energy. They come home, and they got a thousand things on their mind. And, and, you know, the last thing they're thinking about is, you know what, taking care of the wife or satisfying the needs of the wife. They just don't have that desire. And it's become a problem among men and women. They're just not interested. So there's a lot of women out there starving for affection. And guess what? They go to work, and some guy starts giving them attention and giving them a little touch in the back. You're like your hair today. Wow, your makeup looks awesome. Wow, that dress just looks amazing on you. No, no, we got to put the work in, in this area. We've got to maintain our marriages. Let me hear a good amen to that because that's a serious topic. Here's number three, manage your mind. In other words, be careful what's coming in. I talked about that earlier. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.22. It says, run from anything that stimulates useful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. In other words, God's saying, hey, be careful what you allow to come into your heart. Be careful with that. Here's number four. Minimize the opportunity to be tempted. In other words, don't put yourself in a situation where you will be trapped. First of Corinthians 10, 12 says, so be careful if you're thinking, I'll never behave like that. Let this be a warning to you or you too may fall into sin. Keep watching, pray, Jesus said, that you don't fall into temptation. In other words, stay alert. Be aware that there are some situations out there that you got to avoid. By the way, there are things as a pastor that I have to avoid. There are things that I'm not involved in. There are things that, there's, it's not a sin, it's not wrong, but I know Victor, and I know I don't need to be in those situations, and neither do you. And when you find yourself in those situations, you need to say, I got to get out of here. Or you need to be, throw up a prayer and say, Lord, I need your strength. Get me out. God, help me. And God's going to get you out. You know what I've learned? I've learned that that means you got to be careful 
with the people you hang around with. 1 Corinthians 5.33 says, bad company corrupts good behavior. The Bible says avoid bad company. Not because you think you're too good for them, but because you're not good enough. And they're going to they're gonna bring you in. You don't need to hang around with people that celebrate affairs and talk and celebrate how they've cheated on their wife or their husband. You don't have to be around somebody that's talking about all their escapades. You don't need to be a part of that. You need to avoid that. And if you hear that, you need to stand up and say, you know, I'm not committed to that. I'm committed to my spouse. I am a follower of Christ. I honor marriage. It's an honorable thing. Yes. Now, they might not invite you to tea or lunch anymore, but that's okay. You don't need to be hanging with them. Here's the fifth thing. Maintain a proper relationship with the opposite sex. I mentioned that earlier. But do you know, let me tell you this, do you know where, why most affairs starts? Most affairs starts usually between couples that know each other. Second of all, it, it's, it's, uh, it's family relative members, in-laws, people that you go to Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner to. And then, of course, at work, it starts there. You need to be careful. You know what? Watch your relationships. Ephesians 5.3 says, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Be careful that you're not sending mixed messages to the people around you. Be careful with that. Stay away from people that are sending you mixed messages. Publicly proclaim your love to your, to your, to your mate, to your spouse. Let it be public. You know what? I'm not looking. I'm not interested. I love my wife. I love my husband. That's not an option in my life. I'm committed to my marriage. Send that message. Let people know that. Guys, put your ring back on. Amen. Ladies, put your rings on. But pastor, when I go to the gym, I, I don't need it. No, you need it at the gym too. <laughs> you sure do. Be careful. Be careful how you're touching uh, people of, of the opposite sex. Be careful with that. You know, in church, uh, we, are, we encourage people to be loving. We tell you, embrace somebody. You know what? Shake somebody's hand. But you know what I've learned? You've got to be careful who you touch and who you, don't, who you embrace and you don't embrace. Do you know that there is appropriate touch and there's inappropriate touch? Do you know that there's some people you don't need to be hugging? You know who you don't need to be hugging? People that you are attracted to. Now, you know who you're attracted to. Don't be hugging those people. Don't be talking sweet stuff to them either. Amen. Don't hug them. All right? Be careful. Be honest with yourself. And say, just, you know what? This is my sister, my brother. We're going to the same church. We're in the same family. We work together. But I'm not going to go there. Here's number six. Don't listen to complaints about another person's spouse if you're the opposite sex. Listen, someone comes to you, wants a shoulder to cry on. You say, you know what? I love you. You're my sister. I, I want to help you. But you need to talk to sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. I can't help you with this. Make it clear. You're not open to talk. You know how that's how relationships are. We start connecting. Don't connect with somebody else that way. Number seven, be aware of immoderate dress. Now, I got to be careful here. Because here, I'm not saying that you shouldn't dress well and you shouldn't look good and you shouldn't smell good. That's not what I'm saying. But I will tell you that there are people that have a problem with self-esteem and they dress not because they want to look good, not because they want to smell good. They dress to draw attention to themselves. By their dress, they say, everybody look at me. Ain't I cute? Ain't I handsome? Aren't you interested? I might be available. <laughs> now, you don't have to be too smart or too spiritual or to be too discerning. When you're around, you see that. I mean, I have family that are not Christians, and I go to their weddings, I go to their quinceañeras, I go to their fiestas. And you know what? Some of the people that they invite, they're not dressed to celebrate a quinceañera or a wedding. They're dressed to kill. Amen. <laughs> and before that night's over, you know there's going to be some problems. Some chairs are going to get moved up around in there somewhere. You know, things are going to happen. And what I'm telling you as Christians, yeah, dress your best. But your motives, why are you doing it? If you're doing it because you have low self-esteem and you want attention and you want people to notice you, that's a red flag. No. Be careful with your dress. And here's, here's number eight. Magnify the consequences. Minimize the benefits. In other words, if, you're comp comp if you have the opportunity to be unfaithful, ask yourself, what are the benefits? What are the consequences? Always understand the consequences are worse than the benefits. 
Hebrews 11.25 says this. It says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but it does not last. Proverbs 6.32 says, a man who commits adultery is another fool, for he destroys his own soul. Proverbs 6.26, adultery will cost a man all he has. And we know that today. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 6, it says, This is God's will, that He wants you to be holy and completely free from immorality. The Lord will punish those who do such wrong. Ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? No, it's not worth it. Listen, it will destroy you emotionally. It will create guilt, disillusionment. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. Do you know that most, a lot of second marriages start because of an affair that happened in the first marriage? And what happens is they'll, they'll leave their wife or their husband, they'll go with this person, and do you know that divorce is higher among second marriages than among first marriages? Because you know what happened, the affair brought them together, but they had nothing that would keep them together. Be careful with that. You know, I'm committed. Let me end with that as the worship team comes up. I'm committed to be faithful. For the rest of my life, what about you? And people ask me why. Well, let me tell you why. There's three reasons why I'm committed. Number one, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him with all my heart. I hold him everything I have. I was a 16-year-old boy, had no future, didn't know where I was going. God came, Jesus came into my life, turned things around, has done some amazing things, things I never thought or imagined in my life. And because of that, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. And then the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I love the Lord. Number two is I love my wife and I love my kids. You know, the thought of hurting my wife, hurting my kids, my grandkids, hurting this congregation is unbearable to me. It's not worth it. Moments of gratification, whatever, you know, whatever that may be, it's not worth it. And then the third thing is I fear God. I fear the Lord. The Proverbs Proverb 16, 6 says, through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. You know what? Nobody gets away with it. God knows. The Bible says one day we'll stand before him. And I want to stand before him clean. And I want to have a clean conscience. But the other reason, I'll tell you one more that I did not include. I want to be able to stand up here and tell you, you need to be clean. You need to stay pure. People ask me, and it's, it's, a, it's probably an inappropriate question, but I've had people ask me, have, have you been faithful to your wife? And I'm sure you're thinking that. You know, 43 years, have you been faithful? It's like asking a woman how old she is, right? I mean, you never ask that question. But before God is my witness, and all of you here, I have been faithful. And I attend, intend to be faithful. Amen. And I told you why. Why I intend to be faithful. Amen. But I want to be able to stand up here and speak with passion and conviction of something that I have practiced. Because I don't think I'd be able to do it if I didn't practice it. You know, I, 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 that's why I don't, I don't drink. People say, well, Christians can drink. I know. But I cannot with integrity tell somebody you need to stop drinking if they say, but you drink. Yeah, you have one and you can handle it. I might have 20, can't handle it. But you can't tell me. I, I, and I don't want anybody. I don't want my kids. I don't want anybody to ever tell me that. Amen. So that's why I don't do it. There's a lot of things I don't do that I probably could do that are not an issue of sin, but I don't want it ever to be a stumbling block where somebody says, well, you don't have a right to tell me that because I know for a fact you do that. So because of integrity, I want to end by addressing two groups of people that are here. First of all, those of you that are here and you're feeling pretty bad right now because I know I've been hard on you and you have messed up and you have crossed the line and you're wondering, can I be forgiven? I want to say to you, you can be forgiven. We serve a gracious God. He is the God of second chances. The Bible says, though, your sins are, are like scarlet that can be as white as snow. But you need to do what I told you. We need to do what the Bible says. Acknowledge it. Stay away. You know what? Don't go back and forth and thinking that God's okay with it. He's not okay with it. It's over. And if you say it's over, it's over. And God will heal you. Get back into the things of God. Not slowly, as fast as you can. And then I want to speak to singles. Singles, I, I want to challenge you. To save yourself for marriage. You're thinking, what does this have to do with us? Save yourself. You know what? Sex outside of marriage causes all kinds of problems. I'll tell you what the biggest problem of sex outside of marriage is. It matures a relationship faster than what is normal. You begin to believe things about the relationship that are not true. That's the power of sex. And what happens is people will, will allow their relationship to mature way too fast because they're having sex. And then after about a year or two that they've been married, they realize it's not all that. And then they start thinking, why did I even marry this person? 
What did I see in this? Well, you saw nothing. What caught you was the chemicals firing off in your brain when you had those encounters. But you will regret it. Stay away from it. Ask God for help. And you can with God's help. God is a, a God of help. He's a present help in times of trouble. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Father God, we ask your presence in the lives of your people today. Father, we live in a world that encourages us, invites us in this area to be unfaithful. As a matter of fact, it is so common that if we're not doing it, we are weirdos. Something is wrong with us. But Father, we want to be pure. And we want to be faithful, Lord, to the vows that we made to you and our spouses. Lord, we do believe that marriage is honorable and should be guarded and protected in this area. I pray for your people. There are some that are, Lord, are trying to recover from this right now. and They need your help. There are those that are in the grips of temptation and Father contemplating taking this terrible step. I pray that you turn them around today. Yes, Lord, I pray for those that it has happened, it has destroyed their lives. They're, they're trying to make sense of it, Lord. And Father, they're devastated. Heal them. Restore them, Lord. Father, I commit to you our marriages today. I commit to you uh, our lives. Because the truth of the matter, Lord, is if we're not committed to you, and if you're not important, all those other things, Lord, really, really are going to go to the wayside. Touch your people today. I pray and I ask you this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.